there and welcome to the program that takes you on the ride in 25 minutes to seek out innovation and creativity that are unique to Africa. This week, we bring you the story of Kemi Sola Bolariwa, a robotics and embedded systems engineer who has developed a smart bra to detect breast cancer. There's also my conversation with Rwandan entrepreneur Henry Yakarundi on how African startups can seek funding and investment. We'll give you more in a moment. This is Tech Trends, and I am Olaemi Udunuga. To create a more diverse and inclusive tech world, we need to inspire and empower the next generation of female role models to pursue and develop their careers in technology and become innovators, leaders and entrepreneurs. Health experts say breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosis in women. And just by simply being a member of the female gender puts one at risk of having the disease, which is why they say early detection and screening is key to increase chances of survival. In our next story, we look at how Kemi Sola Bolariwa, founder of NextWear Technology, is making it easier for women to check for lumps just by wearing a smart bra. Statistics from the World Health Organization states that in 2020, there were 2.3 million women diagnosed with breast cancer and 685,000 deaths globally. It also states that as at the end of 2020, there were 7.8 million women alive who were diagnosed with breast cancer in five years, making it the world's most prevalent cancer. This is a concerning issue for robotics and embedded systems engineer Kemisola Bolariwa, who, after losing a loved one to the disease, decided to embark on a journey to help other women increase the chances of survival. You can agree with me that breast cancer is a threat on women globally, and um, it has the high mortality rates due to late detection. So, how can women now? detect this cancer at early stage. And that is what we're doing. That is what we are using wearable technology to solve, to enable women to know their status, to check their status at the, early, um, at the earliest stage. If there's any abnormality in the breast, if there's um, lump or whatever it might be in the breast, so they'll be able to, to know at the early stage before it grows to um, um, stages and get complicated. <laughs> Kemisola is the founder of Nextwear Technology, a company that builds wearable tech to boost healthcare. And after that emotional experience in 2017, she did some research and realized that early detection is key to treating breast cancer. And so together with her team, they come up with a wearable solution. Um, we came up with a smart bra device that helps women to detect the earliest stage of breast cancer. Aside detecting that, it will also check for the abnormality in the breast. Um, it will monitor daily condition of a patient that has been already diagnosed of breast cancer, maybe someone that has been treated of breast cancer. This bra will help to monitor such um, patients. And we also do this to aid breast self-examination. And this breast examination is what most women have neglected. And it's, it's, the first, it's the first thing we, as a woman, should put into consideration um, for check, for screening, your own um, self-screening in the house. But we have neglected that. So to help women with this, we come up with this device now to help them you know, do this self-examination, self-screening. So you just put it on and check your status when you examine yourself. And that's what we've, we've done so far. The journey actually started in 2019. And after almost two years of research and development, Kemisola launches the first prototype. 
In February 2022, the smart bra was born using ultrasound technology. We are working towards um, accuracy because we want to increase the, the um, penetration. For when we first um, launched it this year, we received so many responses from all over the world, which really helped us with the development, like where we are right now, from no, no responses guide, from um, radiologists, from oncologists, sonographers, and so on. And it's really helping us you know, to like, upgrade what we have on ground, and that is what we are doing right now. Coming to the sensor that we use for this, we are like upgrading the sensor. Instead of using the lower um, uh, frequency, now we have a higher frequency, which we are currently working on. You can see um, we are working on the, um, the bots here. We have so many bots that we'll be using for the new developments now that will, you know, that will help with the efficiency of, of the, of the um, device. We have so many which can, can be talking about, you know, they are kind of technical. So, and that's it. Kemisola says the smart brand needs to be worn for at least 30 minutes for examination and diagnosis, after which it sends the results to the wearer via a mobile app. It's a beehive of activity at the River's ICT Centre as children take part in the holiday tech program. Mind the Gap, as it is called, features children between the ages of 9 and 16 who are taught animation, coding, photography, cinematography and robotics. They get to make presentations to their proud parents as an official of the state government expresses satisfaction with the exercise and assures that the government will create more awareness for next session. What do I want to do as a ministry to create more awareness to, to parents? Because this is the median edition of this, and they, you see that there is, there is a need of awareness so that you go to all Prince and Connor or River State. <laughs> Some parents express their excitement with the progress their children are making in the digital space. As a convener says, the children are being equipped with the requisite skills to fill the tech gap in future. I hope that the Harbour Road team who put together this program will continue literally probably every holiday and just have our children learn robotics, graphics design or whatever else they have to offer because the children of today, they are the future of our nation and they are the future of our lives as parents. Mind the Gap program has been a good program for them. It has taught them a lot of techs in the ICT world and they are practically perfect in all they did here. The teachers are wonderful and the program organizers are very wonderful. For gaining new ICT Vantage skills, the children can't hide their excitement. This program, Mind the Gap, has been a wonderful experience to me personally. Honestly, throughout these past three weeks, I've learned a whole lot of things. Not only the programs we came here for, like, like robotics, animation, photography and remaining. I also learned more things like teamwork, how to work together with your teammates. The three courses that I learned in this Mind the Gap program is photography, animation and robotics. All of them are very nice courses. Other highlights of the program also include demonstration by the kids and presentation of awards to the best students in different categories. Five Egyptian students have won first place in a global healthcare design competition for a non-invasive glucose monitoring device. The students from the American University in Cairo say the Gluco clip aims to serve a substitute for finger pricking or rather invasive blood tests, potentially influencing lives of millions of diabetics around the world. This is like the oximeter which monitors oxygen levels in the blood. The person who wants glucose levels checked should place his finger in the device and press the button or use the application that is connected to the device via Bluetooth. 
Once you press the button, the device starts to check glucose levels in the blood. Then, figures are shown on the device and the application. On the application, you can check past readings and check the history in a graph. The device uses near-infrared spectroscopy and connects to a mobile app, allowing easier and more convenient monitoring of blood glucose levels. Students say they hope more tests will be done on the device to release it on the market. We think in the coming few years, the most important thing is to work more on the device to improve its accuracy further, so then we can think about offering it to the market. But before that, and because it is a medical device, we should make sure that the accuracy is high enough for everyone to use. The device won first place in the 2022 Johns Hopkins Healthcare Design Competition in the Digital Health Track. Australian swimmer Jessica Smith has had an uneasy relationship with prosthetics since a childhood accident but her convictions are being challenged by a British bionic hand that can be updated remotely anywhere in the world. Her parents were advised to fit a prosthesis to help with her development, but the device caused her to upset a boiling kettle when she was a toddler, causing burns to 15% of her body. I don't remember that time, obviously I was too young and the, the, the stress and the trauma from that, but I did have to have skin grafting and I was in and out of hospital for a long, long time. And so for me, there's always been an association between the fact that this prosthetic aid didn't actually help. It created probably one of the most traumatic you know, event in my life. Bionic hands convert electrical impulses from the muscles in the upper arm into movement powered by motors in the hand, enabling a user to hold a glass, open a door, or pick up an egg. Simon Pollard, who founded Covey five years ago, said he wanted to add Bluetooth to the device to allow the company's specialists to update it via an app. The fact we can change some of the things that the customer wants remotely is a really powerful thing, and something really is the first to market. Some rival bionic hands can be app-controlled but Pollard said the ability to talk to a single device sets the Nexus apart. To do that, anonymized data is collected for every user, a task managed by partner NetApp. Smith, who is a speaker and children's author, said Covey was already creating new movements for her. Now I've had um, a few kids ask if I can do different um, hand gestures, some polite, some not so polite, um, and so they're in the process of, of doing it. I, I just asked them this morning and I know that that will be done in the next couple of hours and I'll be able to do that. So it's, it's really, really, really cool. She said the tech was not just changing her life, it was changing the lives of her three children. So I have three children, a six-year-old, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and the older kids are very excited about it. They think it's amazing that I'm like half human, half robot. She said the bionic appearance of the hand was an attraction giving her pride in difference. I'm not trying to hide who I am. I'm adding and sort of expanding on who I am as a person by being able to access technology that's never been available before. Pollard said Covey had signed up 27 distributors globally, including in Australia, China and the United States, and he aimed to increase monthly production to 100. Now you can drop it in put my hand. Put it hands. in the trolley? Yeah, let's put it in the trolley. Woohoo! That is so cool! Since 2017, startup funding across Africa has grown tremendously with startups raising more money across funding deals. The success recorded by some startup founders and the increased focus on entrepreneurship has boosted the drive of many to also engage in the space.
But most of those trailblazing stories came to light mainly because of the amount of funding received. While some startups choose to bootstrap their operations, others simply seek to raise from investors. Henry Yakarundi, CEO of A-Red, shares his thoughts on this. Thank you so much for joining us on the program, Henry. Thanks for having me. You work with startups and you've been to other countries on the African continent. What are some of the key issues they face? Now, as, as you probably know, um, Africa is a very fragmented market. So there's a lot of issues. Funding is definitely one of them. Uh, but there's other issue nobody talks about. Expansion. How do you expand from West Africa to East Africa to Southern Africa? Nobody has really solved that problem. Uh, and also exiting. How do you exit uh, your company? Uh, selling, merge and acquisition are not well developed. Most people trying to exit in stock market outside the continent. So those are the big issues that needs to be solved. And would you say that um, EU entrepreneurs have different problems than the ones in Africa? Yeah, I mean, their, their problem is just definitely different because the, the ecosystem in the EU is well developed. Um, the, the investment ecosystem is well developed. Uh, the market, you can move around the market, which is not a problem we have across Africa, even though it's improving a little bit. But if you're moving, doing business in different countries, you have to register, there's laws are different. So there's no uh, uniformity in those aspects. Um, so the, the challenges is definitely different. I mean, our, our market is just not yet mature or stop. That's really what the biggest difference is compared to the What about having access to the right networks and support ecosystem so they can maximize opportunities? Because, of course, that is also key in the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, so networking is key for, for um, every market, every business. It's not what you know is who you know. And that's a strategy anywhere you go. Um, but that aspect now with, with the internet is much, much easier. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of startup now needs to get into the social media, especially LinkedIn. Uh, networking is, is definitely key. Um, and I always tell, because I, I coach quite a few uh, companies every year, so I always tell them, you know, it's, it's not what you know is who you know but now utilize the technology that exists out there because it's very difficult to network if you're in East Africa trying to network in Ghana, Nigeria, and all those things. But now technology has made it very easy to do so, especially now with all the conferences happening online, um, all the digitization happening. African entrepreneurs need to utilize those tools. Now let's talk about access to investment and capital, which is one lingering issue. How can startups get investors to fund them? And how can they know what kind of investors they need? So investment is a tough topic, right? Because uh, every entrepreneur, including myself, you know, and I've been in business for 20 years, investment has always been a challenge. And for, for African entrepreneurs, it's even harder. Because again, as I said earlier, the ecosystem entrepreneur in Africa is not well developed here. It's getting there, but it's not there yet. And a lot of time when you look for investor, if you're looking for a million dollar plus, a lot of time it depends where you are, right? If you're in South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, some of those big markets, Kenya, then you can find local investors that can invest in, in high ticket price, as they say. But if you're in a smaller market, Rwanda, you know, uh, all those Sierra Leone, all those small markets that are not very well known. It's very difficult for an entrepreneur uh, to find big ticket investment. And a lot of time what you see is investors setting up structure outside Africa to invest 10 million plus. So well, it's extremely difficult. Um, and again, it's part of the networking. Uh, it's, it's part of... Um, building an ecosystem uh, that is not just local, but more international. So it's a tough topic. I don't think we can just, you know, spend a few minutes talking about that, but it, it's very difficult. It's even more difficult for entrepreneurs. But the strategy I always tell them is, don't just focus on VC, because VCs are even more difficult to access the fund. If you look at statistically, 0.1% of 
of entrepreneurs get VC money. It's a very small number. But what you need to do is tap into what they call angel investors um, or angel syndicates. There's a lot of them now in Africa growing, where it's high net worth individual looking for deal. Then those guys are more willing to take risks, but you got to network. You got to find where they are. You got to find where those people network at. So it's a lot of networking aspect and research that you have to do. There is a lot of companies, tools out there that help you find those people. But, you know, still, you have to do the network. Uh, but don't, you know, don't, don't think local. If you don't find the money locally, go outside the local framework. Go online. Google angel investors in West Africa, for example. See who's doing what. So it's a, it's a lot of research involved in that. And of course, you have to develop your documentation, your pitch deck, and all so on and so forth. But that's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. Talking about angel investors, do you think we have enough of them in Africa? We'll never have enough money, and we'll never have the angel investors. So there is money out there. That's what I always tell people. The money is not the issue. The is access. If you look carefully, the people that raise the most money in Africa uh, in startups, right? They, they have a strong network. And a lot of them raise actually from Silicon Valley. It's not by accident, it's by design. So the money is out there. Now is your connection. Because again, you, you're talking about getting money from someone to your business. And for that to happen, you have to build trust. Trust is the foundation of fundraising, right? It doesn't matter how great your company is, uh, unless you have amazing, amazing growth, which is very difficult to achieve. If you're an average company trying to raise money, you have to be able to build trust. How do you build trust? You have to document your journey, right? Because the person who's, who's, who you you targeting for investment, he or she does not know you. So now they have to make sure they're going to give money to somebody who's not going to go out there and buy a house or a car, so on and so forth. So trust is everything. Uh, but do we have enough angel investors that are out there telling people that they are angel investors? No, it's still a very close niche uh, uh, ecosystem. You have to know somebody that knows who's trying to invest or not. But it's changing just a little bit too slow. Finally, as someone who has worked so hard in the ecosystem, what do you think we need to do to take things to the next level? There's two key things that's going to have to be done for the ecosystem to get to the next level. First one is R&D. You cannot build a local economy on foreign technology. You just can't. And today, grants on research and development in Africa is almost non-existent. Most of the grant that exists in Africa come from outside. And they're here to fulfill their interests, not African interests. And with global warming coming, we've seen with COVID, more than ever, there's a need of local innovation. And the ecosystem in Africa is very unique. So it has to be made for the African ecosystem. And we don't have that yet. The second thing is for African government to start consuming African innovation solution and product. We need to allocate the African government budget for internal, regional, continental businesses, right? We need to stop going outside the continent to spend our, our, our currency, especially foreign currency, on, on, to solve our problem. It's just not going to work. Again, you cannot build an economy on foreign technology. You have to build your ecosystem for that ecosystem to flourish and for that economy to flourish. Well, thank you so much, Henry, for joining us on the program. Thank you so much again. And that's it on this episode of Tech Trends. Many thanks for staying with us. As always, we will continue to show you how tech-savvy innovators are crafting homegrown solutions using technology in the country. From startups to big techs and, of course, inventful thinkers, we'll show you all. And if you missed any parts of the show, you can always catch up on social media at Tech Trends TV or on the channel's TV YouTube account. For Tech Trends, I'm Olaemi Odunuga. See you next time.